Carnegie Museum of Natural History. My name is Jessica. I am super thrilled that you are here with me today. Wish I could see you in person, but I'm equally as excited to see you here through this camera. I am gonna show you all around this fabulous exhibition. It's called Dinosaurs in Their Time. And I don't know about you, but dinosaurs are one of my very favorite things to study and to learn about. So we're gonna look at some really cool fossils today, some really cool plants that were around the fossils. We're gonna look at all different things that happened through time of the Mesozoic era, which is when the dinosaurs ruled the world. So first up, we are here in what we call the Triassic zone. So Triassic was part of the Mesozoic era. The Mesozoic era is the whole span of time that the dinosaurs were the, the main creatures here on the land, right? The most dominant. The Triassic is the very beginning. It can go back somewhere 230, 250 million years ago. And we are looking at a group of really cool animals in here that are actually all reptiles. There is only one set of animals in this room that are actually dinosaurs. I wonder if you can guess. I'll give you a little hint. They are not in fossil form, they are drawings. On the back wall there, you can see a set of dinosaurs we call coelophysis. And if you look below, we have the fossil bones of those dinosaurs. It's a real big jumble. It's almost impossible to know what's going on in there. But the paleontologists left it in the bone. We call this a bone bed. They left it, they left it there in the rock so that you can see how the little fossils are found. Paleontologists go all over the world looking for these dinosaur bones from millions and millions of years ago. So this bone bed has bones from coelophysis. They're very, very fragile. And there on the back wall, we can see the picture of what we think that dinosaur looked like. It was a small dinosaur. It would have been a predator, some sharp teeth and claws. And then next to it, this really big thing called Redondosaurus. Redondosaurus is not a dinosaur. It's actually a reptile. So all dinosaurs come from the reptile family tree, but around this time in the Triassic, we start to see more and more of these dinosaurs <clears throat> that are changed and different enough that we give them the title dinosaur rather than reptile. So Redondosaurus is kind of like a crocodile or an alligator, and it has a very typical stance um, that we would say uh, reptiles have. If, so picture a turtle or a lizard, they have their arms and legs sort of out to the side kind of walking on all fours, right? That's how Redondosaurus would have, would have walked. But if you look at Coelophysis, you can notice he's actually standing on two legs. So one thing about the dinosaurs that was different, whether they walked on four legs or two legs, their legs were underneath their body. So picture something like an elephant or even people. If we were on our hands and knees, our legs are underneath our hips. So that's a little bit of a difference there. And that's one of the clues that scientists use when they're trying to determine if something's a reptile or a dinosaur. All right, come with me. We are going to go further along here. Showing through time now to a Jurassic dinosaur. And you've probably heard that name Jurassic before, right? Especially because there's a whole lot of movies that have that really, really cool title. So this is a dinosaur called Camarasaurus. And guess what? When this dinosaur died, it was not full grown. So this giant fossil that you see behind me was not even a full grown dinosaur. It would have been somewhere in its younger age maybe a kid or a teenager sort of age that we would consider. What's really cool about this fossil, and this is a sauropod, a long neck dinosaur, we're gonna see a few of those. This fossil is left in the actual rock that it was found. In. So like I showed you Coelophysis that was in the bone bed, we are also looking at a dinosaur found in its bone bed. This comes from Dinosaur National Monument out west. And actually a lot of our dinosaurs come from out west, from places like Wyoming and Utah, this dinosaur, when it died, it was in some sort of sediment that got covered up quickly. So maybe like a flood where water would have covered up the body really, really quickly. And all the sediment in the rock eventually would have, or in the water eventually over time would have replaced the bone that you see there. So then eventually what you have is a fossil. And now it takes a long, long time for something to become a fossil, thousands of years, sometimes millions. And this particular fossil is in a really cool position in the way that we can still see it, the way it was brought here from the actual rock. This was put on a train and brought here in this giant piece of rock from out west. Pretty cool. So this one's called Camarasaurus lentus. Like I said, it had a nice long neck. It was a plant-eating dinosaur. It had big elephant-like trunk-like legs underneath it. Okay, we're going to move over here. And now I have a question for you. How can you tell if an animal eats meat? or plants. This is an excellent example here. So if you had to guess, 
which dinosaur, either Ceratosaurus, which is the taller one in the back, or the smaller one in the front, Dryosaurus? What do you think? Oh, I see that someone says the teeth. Yes, excellent. Teeth are an excellent way to figure out whether it's an animal eats meat or plants. So Ceratosaurus in the back, dead giveaway here, right? We can tell this thing eats meat. Look at those sharp, short, pointy teeth. They're almost like little steak knives inside his mouth. And he also has real hard, you know, sharp claws um, in the, on the, his hands. So they're a little hard to see on this dinosaur. Dryosaurus in the front here, on the other hand, really tiny little flat teeth, sort of like the teeth you have in the back of your mouth that are wide and flat. Those are really good for grinding things like plants. So these are really good examples of how we can tell things by looking at their fossils, and whether, what kind of things it ate, what kind of things, how it would have moved maybe. You look at dryosaurs, it has sort of like a little hand instead of like big sharp, you know, claws like some of these dinosaurs do. That's another indication that that probably wasn't a predator. That was not something that was hunting. It was, it was something that was foraging and looking for things like plants. So paleontologists use all kinds of clues by looking at the fossils. Sometimes they find out really fascinating things that we never would have known just by looking at a little detail of a bone. On the other hand, there's lots of things we just don't know. We don't know what color they were, right? Because their skin did not turn into a fossil or if they were covered in feathers or something like that. Unfortunately, that doesn't usually fossilize. So we have to make some guesses about how we think that would have looked. And by we do that, by looking at animals that are alive today and comparing where do they live? What's the climate like where they live? Do they live in a forest? Do they live in the water? Um, and we make comparisons like that. Okay, so I'm gonna take you into my favorite room in the entire museum. This is the Jurassic room, part of dinosaurs in their time where the Jurassic dinosaurs are. We were just looking at some Jurassic fossils and now we're gonna look at a big giant collection. So here we are with the sauropod. This big one in front of me is called Patasaurus Louise. Patasaurus was a very big sauropod that lived in the Jurassic area. And it maybe was probably somewhere around 30 tons. Very, very big, 35. And long neck, really long skinny tail big hefty bones, would have walked on all four legs and would have just walked around looking for plants to eat. Maybe a couple thousand pounds worth of plants every single day. Very, very cool. And we'll come over here and I'm gonna show you my friend Stegosaurus because you can't have a dinosaur before without a Stegosaurus, right? I'm sure you guys have seen Stegosaurus before. This is one of the coolest dinosaurs with the big plates all over its back. So if you had to guess, what do you think those plates would be used for? You ever seen a a, an animal that has kind of weird things on its body? Maybe uh, quills or scales? Well, this one had big giant plates on the top. What was cool about Stegosaurus is that not only does it have these big plates on its back, but on its tail, it has these big long spikes. Ooh, you, okay, I saw a note about it could change colors. That is an actually, that is a theory that some scientists believe for sure. But like I was talking about with not knowing uh, some of the things like whether or not, you know, what color they were, this is one of those things. We just don't quite know exactly what these plates would have been used for. But scientists have lots of different, different theories. Some of them think it had to do with heat regulation for their body temperatures. Some things it had, maybe they could change color and it was a warning sign to other dinosaurs. Um, probably wasn't great defense because it wasn't a real thick, hard plate. Then again, if you see a dinosaur like this, maybe you'd be scared off just because it does look so big and scary. On the other hand, those tail spikes, we know definitely could cause damage and definitely could injure a dinosaur that was trying to attack Stegosaurus. Those big long spikes have even left marks in other fossils of animals like Allosaurus. So we can look at it and say, okay, for sure, Stegosaurus could defend itself with that amazing tail. Tiny little head, big body, big plates on its back. Pretty hard to mistake Stegosaurus. That was a really, really unique dinosaur. Okay, we're gonna keep walking. We're gonna keep walking through this Jurassic room. So the fossils in this room, all of, these are animals that lived at the same time and in the same place. Go back here, we're gonna see one of our predators. This is Allosaurus. Looks a lot like a T-Rex. Sometimes people think it's a T-Rex, but it's actually not. It's Allosaurus, which lived many, many millions of years before t rex Allosaurus has three really long, sharp claws on its front limbs. And remember that, because I'm going to show you something about the T-Rex when we do go see it. Very different. Allosaurus had a mouthful of those steak knife teeth, right? Look how sharp they are. Powerful jaws, 
definitely could hunt something down. And I think if you saw that, you'd run, right? So it's pretty, pretty big, but it's not nearly as big as some of the other predators. So it would have had to be pretty fast and it would have had to be good to hunt. So there's lots of theories. Maybe they went and hunted in packs like wolves do. Um, but again, things that we don't really know for sure that we lost, spend lots of time trying to figure out by looking at the fossil record. So back here, we're gonna go and see our other sauropod, Diplodocus carnegii. And if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because it's named after Andrew Carnegie who founded this museum and the library and all other kinds of cool things that I'm sure you've heard about. So Diplodocus carnegii is probably our most famous dinosaur. He's on the t-shirt I'm wearing today. He's our mascot as well. We call him Dippy and that's because we love him very much. Dippy was a sauropod that lived in the Jurassic probably about 140, 150 million years ago. Could have been up to about 85 feet long, but much thinner bones, not nearly as robust as what we saw with Apatosaurus. Thinner bones, not maybe not quite as thick, but definitely, definitely long and skinny. If you tried to walk from one end to the other, it would take you quite a while to get. So this long whip-like tail was definitely something that could help this dinosaur defend itself. Same thing with Apatosaurus. So if something like Allosaurus is chasing it, maybe that tail can come in handy and knock it over. It's definitely like a big long whip. So these sauropods could, there's all different kinds of sauropods. They found on every continent in, in the world, all different parts of the age of dinosaurs. These ones, like I said, are from the Jurassic. They were found in places like Wyoming and Utah. And we're walking here and you can see how long it is. Look at this neck. So here's a cool fact. So one of the things paleontologists do is they spend a lot of time comparing modern animals with fossils so that they can kind of make some guesses about what their lives were like. If you look at a giraffe, a giraffe has the same long neck, right? Nice, long, flexible neck, just like Dippy did. However, a giraffe has long, elongated bones, which means the bones aren't short, they're real long and skinny. And there's only seven neck bones, which is just what humans have in our neck, same as us. Dippy, on the other hand, had extra vertebrae, maybe something as much as 15, maybe even more, uh, that made his neck nice and long like that. And they definitely have an interesting structure. See, so yeah, they're sort of like puzzle pieces that fit together. And in the front of his face, all he has are these little sharp teeth, probably wouldn't have been chewing much with those teeth, just pulling the plants off the, off the ground or off the tree and swallowing them. And then everything gets digested in his big old belly. We're gonna walk over and look at this really cool fossil that we can actually, you can touch if you come here to the museum. So this is a femur or a thigh bone of the Plotica, which is the big dinosaur we were just looking at. This is a leg bone. It's the same bone you have in your leg. So it goes from your hip down to your, it's the longest bone we have in our body and it's the longest bone that you have in your body as well. This is so tall. If I laid down, it'd be just about as tall as I am almost five, really, really big. And this is from 150 million years ago. This is a real fossil. You can touch it when you come here to the museum. If you look real close, you can even see where they kind of, uh, the, the fossil scientists took the uh, little tools and sort of chipped away, you know, at the rock behind it. So what I'm touching now is not a bone anymore. It's a fossil. A fossil means it was mineralized bone. It used to be a bone. All the things that were bone have now turned into this big rock. You can learn a lot about um, the climate and, and what life was like in that area based on these fossils, what kind of rocks were in, uh, taking up the, making the composition of the, of the actual rock around. It's a really cool thing. If you come here, you definitely gotta come and touch the thing. All right, friends, we're gonna walk over and we're gonna look at a really big skull. So here we're gonna walk underneath Dippy. We're gonna head over here. Now, if you remember, I showed you a really cool fossil called Camarasaurus that was still in the bone. I mean, it was still in the bone bed, in the rock, in the wall. This is a skull of another Camarasaurus. This Camarasaurus would have been full size, so pretty big, right? Much bigger than the one we saw um, of the juvenile one that was on the wall. Like I said, told you it, it, it probably died when it was younger, maybe like teenage. So if you have a good look up close here, you can see the teeth. Definitely not sharp and pointy like the ones we saw in Allosaurus. These are like kind of like pegs almost, right? They look sort of like stone tools inside his mouth. Big snout, 
uh, kind of like a crest on the top there. Uh, and this is another animal that, of course, would have just been eating a whole lot of plants. Okay. All right, we are going to head now towards the late Jurassic and then getting close to get to the Cretaceous. But I wanted to stop and show you a couple really cool things in this room. This is a model. So we're looking at real fossils most of the time. You're about 70%. So basically, if you look at 10 bones, seven out of those 10 on average would be real bones. The others are bones that maybe we, another scientist had found and sent us a copy of them, or maybe we just filled in the blanks based on the rest of the bones. This one is called Cetacosaurus. Cetacosaurus is a really cool little critter, uh, would have been living in places like Asia. And what's really notable about Cetacosaurus is those quills on the back of his tail. He also has some cool horns on his face, which I always really think were neat. But this is something we can actually see in the fossil. So we made a model of it, but this is the fossil here. And if you look, you can see on the back of the fossil here, there's actually the quills showing up here in the fossil. So all those little spines that you see are the quills from that. And it does, it looks like a pet. And across here, we have a really interesting collection of creatures. There are three different creatures in this room. Now, only one of them is a bird. They all look like birds, don't they? Two of them are dinosaurs, and one of them is what we consider a bird. So like in the very beginning of the tour, when I was telling you that dinosaurs came from reptiles, and eventually we started calling them different things because their bodies were different, same thing happened with birds. Dinosaurs, some of them became birds through time, through change over time, another word we use for that is evolution, right? So this one here, Cynorithosaurus, you would look at that and think maybe that's a predatory bird. It's actually still a dinosaur. And the difference is it has teeth in its mouth instead of just a beak. And it has hard, sharp claws on, you know, in this front wings, the way that his claws are. And just the anatomy, how his body's put together, that long bony tail. Some of these are, are uh, tips that let the scientists know that this was actually still considered a dinosaur. However, in the late Jurassic, some of the dinosaurs, so many changes were happening to their bodies that they eventually started calling them a different category of thing called birds. So I'm not sure if you know this, you probably do, because I know you kids are probably super smart and watch a lot of these cool things about dinosaurs on TV, but every bird you see in the world today is a dinosaur. It's a descendant of a dinosaur. So birds existed way back here in the late Jurassic and in the Cretaceous, some of them survived the mass extinction that wiped out all the rest of the dinosaurs and birds continued on and we still have birds today. So when you're looking at a bird or a chicken, anything flying around nearby, I have lots of cardinals near my house, those are dinosaurs. It's amazing. I love that. And I think it's really cool when you kind of start watching them and watching their anatomy and how they move. That's how we, we think a lot of the dinosaurs will work too. So especially these ones here that are very fun. All right, we are heading into the Cretaceous. This is a super cool room. This is the end of the day, age of dinosaurs. This little friend we're going to look at is another smaller one called Protoceratops. So eventually we're going to see a friend called Triceratops, which you've probably heard of because much like my friend Stegosaurus, it's a popular one. This is Protoceratops. This one has some really cool features on, an, on its anatomy. Look at that big jaw, right? It has like sort of like a, a beak in the front that can prop teeth. It has a frill on the back of its head. Uh, that probably would have been used to defend itself. And then little skinny bodies, long finger and, and toe bones sort of going on. And a really cool tail that I think looks sort of like a fin. So these are early uh, versions of what we see later of these ornith ornithicians, which are dinosaurs that have some, uh, honestly, most of them have really cool like features on them and frills and things like that. Um, eventually we see things like triceratops. So I know you've been waiting. It's one of my favorite parts of the whole building. Too. Well, we can I ask a question first? Oh, we got a question. Of course. So I'm just curious if dinosaurs were around today, I mean, beyond birds. Yes. Is there a possibility that there's a certain kind of dinosaur that people would be able to keep as a pet? That is an excellent question. So do you remember we looked back at two dinosaurs side by side and I was talking about carnivores and herbivores, right? Meat eaters and plant eaters. That little one in the front, Dryosaurus, with his little teeth and his little hands, I think something like that probably could have been a pet, right? Maybe that Protoceratops we just looked at. I mean, that thing was pretty small. 
maybe could have been, you know, I mean, I had a dog that was bigger than that dinosaur once in my life. So it's possible. I think you'd have to go for the ones that we 100% know only ate plants because I don't think you want a meat eating dinosaur in your house, right? It's fun to think about. I always wonder that thing myself. Okay, so we so, have two no, no pet T-Rexes then. <laughs> no, oh no, I hope not because I don't think your house would be big enough to even fit this T-Rex. If it is, if you have a giant yard and lots of acres and acres of property, I still don't think you want this T-Rex. Let's look at it and figure out why we don't want T-Rex as our pet. All right, we talked about sharp pointy teeth. These are like the quintessential king of all the sharp pointy teeth. Look at those teeth. Some of them are six inches long and their teeth just kept growing. It would fall out and they would just grow more. So T-Rex has very distinct teeth. On the inside of that tooth, there's serrations, which is the same thing that you see on a steak knife, right? Little notches that make it extra sharp. Every one of T-Rex's teeth has that exact same thing. So we look, it has a flexible S-shaped neck. And remember I showed you Allosaurus with the big three claws? Look at this guy, short little arms, only two claws. So that is something that happened over time where the animals in that, in that family tree evolved and changed enough that now there's only two claws on this T-Rex. What were they doing with those tiny arms? We don't really know. We don't really know. Maybe they just didn't need them. They have a really big, powerful head, powerful legs, a big, powerful tail. Maybe they didn't need those arms to hunt. So looking at his big, powerful legs, he's got the big claws on the ground, big feet, the big impressions in the ground, and then the big, long tail in the back probably very powerful. And there's lots of debate on whether or not this T-Rex could probably run or, or run fast. I just recently watched a documentary with David Attenborough that says they don't think they were that fast, but we don't really know for sure. So we have two in this room side by side here in the Cretaceous. The one we just looked at is a real fossil and it is actually the holotype. So what holotype means is it was the first dinosaur to be named that particular species. So Dippy and Apatosaurus, a lot of our dinosaurs here are actually holotypes. But this T-Rex here on that you're seeing on the left of your screen is the holotype. That means anytime a scientist finds something that they think is a Tyrannosaurus rex, they have to compare it to ours to make sure it really is truly a Tyrannosaurus rex. That's super important in the field of paleontology and all sciences actually. And over to our right here, we have a copy, a replica of another dinosaur from Dinosaur Museum out west. Uh, another one that's here fighting with our T-Rex, or maybe they're friends, who knows, having a T-Rex party. But there is an Edmontosaurus fossil in between them that doesn't look like it survived much. So we're kind of thinking maybe these two T-Rexes are fighting over their lunch. This is an Edmontosaurus skeleton right here. Of course, it's only part of it, right? So T-Rex had a big, strong, powerful jaw. Lots of debate on whether uh, other dinosaurs that were bigger maybe had more powerful jaws. Things like crocodiles have very powerful jaws. So imagine the bite of something like that could probably tear right through, you know, anything. It could chew through bone. All right, we're gonna go and visit the Triceratops in the back here. So I showed you Protoceratops. Oh yeah, no, too. and this is, Triceratops, much bigger than what we looked at with Protoceratops, right? Triceratops is definitely an easy one to spot. Uh, you can't really miss it. Tri, it means three, right? Three horns on his head. You see one on his nose and then two above his eyes. Another little beak, sort of like we saw in big flat teeth. Again, a plant eater, probably picking up plants out of the ground, just picking up with that beak, beak and chewing them and a big frill. So the back of his skull, that's called a frill. And this fossil is mostly a replica except the skull. And that's actually really common with these ceratopsian dinosaurs like protoceratops and triceratops. Their skulls are so big and heavy that they fossilize really well. And over time, scientists are able to find them, but they don't always find um, complete skeletons of things. In fact, it's very rare to find something that we would consider pretty complete. Our apatosaurus is about as close as you can get. It's about 90%. This one, everything on here is a replica. We have some other museum owns the body of this thing and we made a copy of it, which is pretty cool. Now we're gonna turn our attention to the sky. So while dinosaurs were walking around on the earth, there were some flying reptiles. They're not dinosaurs, but they're pretty close. I don't know if I can get it. Wait, Wait. Um, <laughs> let's see if we can get it on camera. It's there we go. Like oh, there we go. Little bit. This is called Quetzalcoatlus. Quetzalcoatlus is a pterosaur. 
So it doesn't look like the Loch Ness Monster. So pterosaurs are flying reptiles. Again, we're going to put them in the category of reptiles because they're more like reptiles than dinosaurs. So uh, we call them flying reptiles. This thing would have had massive wings from tip to tip, probably school bus could fit between tip to tip of its wings. And the wings were based on a four fingered hand and that four finger. So basically like it didn't have a pinky, that little ring finger that you have is elongated and stretched out. And that's that big long bone that you see. The rest, his little fingers are kind of up at the top there. Big head, big body, hollow bones, much like birds today. They have hollow bones that make them nice and light so that they can fly. Imagine seeing a Quetzalcoatlus flying in the sky, something like this. Okay, we're going to go back here, see another Cretaceous dinosaur, a really super cool one if you ask me. This one is called Anzu Wailat, and there's something really special about this dinosaur. A couple things. Well, one of them, you can tell that this thing is related to birds, right? Definitely close to being a bird. This is about as close to being a bird as you can get, but it's still a dinosaur. It's got those long hooked claws. It's got a bony long tail. And it's got some other features on it that definitely makes a dinosaur. If you look at its head, it's got a big crest and a long, flexible S-shaped neck and big, long, skinny legs. And we know from finding fossil impressions that this dinosaur was covered in feathers, which actually a lot of them were. Now I'm going to show you something really cool that we have in our education collection. This is an oviraptorosaur claw. So Anzu is an oviraptorosaur. Those are a, a certain type of dinosaurs. Like I said, just about as close to being birds as you can be in still being dinosaurs. And this is its claw. Imagine it had this uh, three claws in the front, three claws in the back of its, of its wings and its feet. And this is inside. This is a bone. So this is inside a nail. So here I have a finger, right? This is my finger. Here's the nail on the end of it. Imagine this is covered with a nail too. Big, scary claw. So obviously this is an animal that was able to use that claw to do pretty much whatever it wanted to do. And this is an omnivore. So we talked about carnivores that eat meat, herbivores that eat plants. This is an omnivore, much like humans, that can eat both plants and um, animals, insects, things like that. Oviraptorosaurs are super interesting. For many, many years, they thought they only existed in places like Asia, but now we know they were here in North America as well. And this one, I have a particularly uh, soft spot in my heart for because this dinosaur was named after our own paleontologist, Dr. Matthew Lamont. So Dr. Lamana has been all over the world, every continent looking for dinosaur bones. And this is one of the dinosaur bones that he got to name. When you're a paleontologist, if you're the first one to find a dinosaur that no one else has ever found, and you can prove, you can compare it to others and prove that it's a brand new dinosaur, you get to pick the name. Imagine that. Someday you might find a dinosaur and get to name it yourself. Dr. Matt has named many, many dinosaurs, but this is one of my favorites. And because we have the, the fossil here in the building, um, scientists come to study it. It's a really, really interesting thing and super thrilled that we have him here on our team. Ms. Romano, I want to ask a question. We got a question asking about underwater dinosaurs. Are there any underwater dinos? This is actually an excellent, perfectly timed question because we are just about to head into the Cretaceous Seaway. So hold that thought. I'm going to tell you all about what was living in the water at the time the dinosaurs were walking on the land. Okay, off we go. Okay, friends, so we're walking now through the end of the Cretaceous. The Cretaceous was the end of the age of dinosaurs. And there were lots of different things, not just those crazy ornithicians and things like T-Rex, but we also had things like hadrosaurs. So here's a hadrosaur, Perithosaurus. These are called duckbill dinosaurs. And if you look real close at its face, you can kind of see why we call them that. They have sort of a weird beak-like duckbill on the front of its mouth. This one is called Corythosaurus, and it's a hadrosaur. There were lots of different hadrosaurs, and yes, it's very bendy. And the hadrosaurs uh, probably moved in, in you know, groups and herds. They were plant eaters, sort of like sheep, just kind of wandering about in North America. Um, some of them were up in Canada and places like uh, our, like Dinosaur National Monument and other places that we got our fossils. Some of them from out west as well. Uh, definitely has a flexible neck. They think these animals probably could walk on two or four legs, depending on what it wanted or needed to do. The other thing about um, hadrosaurs, and 
that it's pretty cool is that they had this crest on their head. And this one doesn't have a real big crest. Some of them, like Paris or all of us, have a much bigger crest on its head that scientists think they could use to make sound. And it would help the other herd members know what was going on. It was used for protection and things like that. And the sound would have been sort of like a honking or like a hooting sort of inside. inside. Again, something we don't know for sure. Okay. Awesome. So we are headed into the Cretaceous Seaway. And you asked about dinosaurs that lived in the water. Well, there were definitely some dinosaurs that spent time in the water, things like Spinosaurus. That's from places like Egypt. But there were mostly fish and swimming reptiles. That's what was going on in the oceans and the seaways at the time the dinosaurs were walking around. So this room we call the Cretaceous Seaway because these are all creatures that lived in North America when there was a big seaway that went right down the middle of the continent. So it separated the east from the west. In places like Kansas and Nebraska, there was water, almost like a little ocean in the middle there. And it only existed for certain periods of time and eventually it dried up and now we have farms there instead. So it's pretty interesting. What we're looking at here are some really cool predatory fish. They have very cool names like Xyphactinus, Pachyrhizotus, very sharp teeth, lots of cool bones. Imagine if you were a hunter, I mean a fisher, and you were out fishing and you found something like this. Pretty amazing, right? So these were in the water. And the only other thing um, that I can say about them is that I would never want to, you know, catch one myself. All right, so back here, we're going to look at some of the creatures that were here in the water in the Cretaceous Seaway. And now Andy's showing you the Mosasaur. So Mosasaurs were giant swimming reptiles. So again, not quite dinosaurs, still reptiles. And if you know anything about the Jurassic World movies, you've probably seen a Mosasaur before. The ones in the movies are really, really big. These are definitely predators, big, sharp teeth. In fact, this one, Tylosaurus, has an extra set of teeth on the roof of its mouth inside. So it's got not just one, but two rows of teeth that could probably be really good at catching big fish like those eye factors. So it would snap its jaw shut and then it could hold onto its prey uh, by those extra little teeth inside. Big flippers, big long tail, very powerful, probably could move very quickly through the water. So these are called mosasaurs. This one in particular is Tylosaurus. And the other main uh, marine reptile that we have back here is something called a plesiosaur. So plesiosaurs, some had long necks, some had shorter necks. This one's got sort of a long neck, very long sort of weird snout mouth kind of on it. Again, really big flippers, almost like turtle flippers. Um, and this again, another predator. So these are all predators that you're looking at in this beautiful diorama. Except this little guy in the front here, Pescavornis, which is sort of like a bird dinosaur combo sort of thing. It's a, it's basically a diving bird, but it doesn't have any front limbs. So instead of wings in the front, it just has this one little bone that probably didn't have anything. So if you imagine walking around like a bowling pin with feet, swimming around in the water, really cool. So this is something that, again, we call it a bird because it's got enough bird features on it, but it, I mean, it does have some dinosaur features. So probably up for debate that one, what, what, which one you'd want to call it. I think it's still pretty much a dinosaur. Very cool. All right, another thing that was living in the in the Cretaceous Seaway and other parts of the world were these giant turtles. I don't know about you, but I love turtles. I think they're amazing. What's really cool about turtles, we have fossils of turtles back 200 million years, which is amazing. So at the time we were starting to see dinosaurs become really dominant all over the world, we were also finding turtles. Amazing. So dinosaur scientists and all different kinds of scientists find these reptile um, fossils. This one is just a Beautiful, beautiful specimen. It looks like a, a piece of art here hanging on the wall. This one's called Protostega. Protostega could be somewhere up to six, 10 feet with this big shell uh, swimming in the waters. Now we don't have sea turtles quite that big today, but we do still have some big ones like the loggerhead are real big. And really what's interesting is they haven't changed much. So these fossils, when you look at their skeleton, are very similar to the sea turtles that are alive today. So we can only assume that they probably left their eggs on land, just like sea turtles do today. Probably moved about and did similar things, ate similar things. It's really fascinating, especially when you can find something that has a fossil um, that you can compare to a modern animal and kind of look and see. But I love this one. I think it's beautiful. You can look at its flippers and count all the little arm, you know, the little finger bones in there. That would have been, of course, covered, you know, with a big turtle flipper. And it's got its bony tail in the back and everything. Just absolutely stunning. One of my very, very favorite things. All right, so we have made our way 
all the way through the entire dinosaur in their time. There's a lot more to see. And I know we probably went pretty quick, but now is a great time if you guys have questions, if you want to talk about anything, there's something that we didn't see that maybe you want to ask about. I am happy to answer your questions. I'm just thrilled that you've been here with me today. Oh, 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 I'll start. Yeah. Um, so Stephen wanted to know how old are dinosaurs in general? Oh, that's a very good question. So the oldest dinosaurs we find around 230, 220 million years ago. And dinosaurs existed all the way until 66 million years ago. So there's a big span of time, 185 or so million years, 150 to 180 million years, the dinosaurs lived on the earth. That's why we call that the Mesozoic, the era of dinosaurs, because they were dominant. They were everywhere and they survived for hundreds of millions of years, which is really, really amazing. Now, in terms of how old each individual dinosaur is, it's really hard to know. We can kind of look at bones, sort of the way scientists look at tree rings. And there are little clues in there that tell you about its growth. So they can sometimes make some, some good guesses on how old an individual dinosaur was. Um, but that's another thing that we study a lot too. How long did it take those dinosaurs from being hatched out of an egg this big, you know, to grow to be a, a, an 85 foot long, amazing creature like we saw with Diplodocus. So yeah, long, long time dinosaurs were the dominant, dominant thing here and there. And because we still have birds today, we could basically say they've been existing this whole time, which is amazing. Definitely a successful set of animals. That's super cool. Ms. Romano, I have several questions that were asked awesome. during your presentation. Um, so one that was asked is, do we know what the different roars sounded like for the different dinos? Ooh, that's an excellent question. So all the little things in an animal's body or in a person's body um, that kind of give you clues as to what they sound like, right? The vocal cords and things like that. Uh, they don't usually turn into fossils. We don't usually get the insides of these animals. It's very rare. Once, once in a while you get an imprint or you get something that fossilized really well. Sometimes they can see um, where a brain was and kind of take all the dimensions and do a 3D print of it and print something out and say, well, this is probably what a brain looked like of this T-Rex or something, which is really cool. So anyway, those are the kinds of things that they look at in the anatomy to make guesses as to whether or not they roared or tweeted or who knows what kind of noises they make. Unfortunately, they probably don't have very good guesses on, you know, exactly what they sounded like, but they can guess also by comparing them. So maybe something like a lion today, you know, that has a certain body structure and a certain way that it hunts, they can compare it to a, a predatory dinosaur that maybe did the same thing and maybe make a guess as to what it sounded like. But again, it's one of those like tricky things that we just unfortunately don't know for sure. Oh, but we understand. Real quick, I just see a lot of people raising their hands. You got to put your questions in chat. So just type your question in chat and I'll be able to answer your question or ask your question or uh, Ms. Hillman will be able to ask your question, okay? Yeah, we got a lot of questions here. So put them in chat. We got another one. We had someone, we talked about underwater dinos. We had someone ask, could, or were there any that could live amongst fire? Oh, that's a very good question. Oh, I don't know. You know, there were definitely some dinosaurs that were armored. In fact, I think some of you might have even seen last year, we had a really cool exhibit called Dinosaur Armor. Um, and the armored dinosaurs would have had sort of like bony plates in their skin. And so that would have protected them from lots of lots of things. I don't know what kind of extreme temperatures they could have been, it existed in though. Um, but I can tell you, because the Mesozoic is so long and the earth was constantly changing during that time, dinosaurs did live in all parts of the world. In fact, our scientist, Dr. Matt Lavana, has actually studied dinosaurs in Antarctica. Um, he goes down there looking for things like birds and, and dinosaur fossils, and they find things like these plesiosaurs that I was showing you um, that were down in Antarctica, which today is a frozen tundra, right? But in the Mesozoic, wasn't, didn't have the ice caps on it. So the, the earth was a little bit different and it was warmer, especially at certain times. However, we know that there was still de definitely temperature changes throughout the world. So dinosaurs could live in all different kinds of temperatures all across the world. Good question. Cool. We have another one. Which is the oldest dinosaur? And then which one was the biggest? That's a very good question. Okay. So ooh, it's one of those things where I feel like if I looked at different books or talked to different scientists, they might tell me something, something different. The biggest dinosaur uh, usually we refer to is those sauropods, those long neck dinosaurs like we were looking at with Dippy. Some of them were massive, as big as Dippy is, 15 tons, 85 feet long. We have dinosaurs out there that were way bigger. So something called Argentinosaurus, that's a good one to look up. Really, really big, uh, Brachiosaurus. There were definitely uh, 
also big predators like Carnotaurus or Giganotosaurus. These are all cool names you can Google or look up in books if you want. Um, but there were definitely some big predators that were even bigger than our T-Rex, although that's definitely one of the bigger ones. Um, but in terms of biggest and heftiest, it was definitely those sauropods. There's a group of sauropods called titanosaurs um, that existed in different places, especially like in Africa and South America. And those titanosaurs got really, really big, sometimes maybe a hundred tons, which is just mind blowing, mind blowing. Oh, and the oldest dinosaur, that was a good question. Um, so Coelophysis is one of the ones that we use. There's also, um, oh God, I'm trying to think of what other ones. They're, they're, they're usually dinosaurs from about that era, 220-ish, maybe million years ago that we find. But Coelophysis is one of the early ones. There's probably something that scientists would pinpoint and say it was the oldest, but really they don't know, especially since we don't find a lot of fossils. It might seem like it when you're walking around this really cool exhibit where we're full of fossils, but they're really are, they really are hard to find. There's a very special set of circumstances that turn a bone into a fossil. And unfortunately, there's parts of the world where that doesn't happen well. Forests, um, you know, drier places. There are places where things just did not fossilize as well. Low, like shallow waterways, that's a perfect place where the water isn't moving much. Sediment builds up and builds up and builds up and, and crushes and presses those bones down and the minerals replace it. There's lots of minerals in water. So places like that turn out the nicest fossils and ones that we find the most of. But here's a good example of how we just don't know things. Those, that Quetzalcoatlus that we found, we only have a few bones. So what you saw is a replica. We wouldn't be able to hang a real Quetzalcoatlus on the ceiling. It probably would have been too heavy. But the one we showed just hanging on the, on the ceiling, it's a replica. It's also, because of those hollow bones, it's definitely lighter, but it still would have been pretty heavy. That thing could stand about as tall as a giraffe and it's standing on all fours on the ground. So, we only have a few bones back. So what scientists do is they extrapolate. And that's a fancy word for, say, for saying they take information that they have, they compare it to something similar, and then they make estimates and guesses based on that to kind of make a, a picture of what they think that is. Now, something like T-Rex, that's a mostly complete skeleton. It's pretty, pretty close, maybe 60%. So we have a lot of that. We can look at that, put all those pieces together like a big puzzle and say, this is what T-Rex looks like. This is what T-Rex moved like. So we have a lot of information. Apatosaurus is a great one. Dippy is a great one. However, some of them, we just don't find a lot of their fossils. Some fossils we have that were lost over time. There were many years that we didn't have any Spinosaurus fossils because they were destroyed during World War II, which is a, a shock, but true. But they were bombed um, in museums, right, during World War II. So there were years where we didn't have any of these fossils that people had dug up of things like Spinosaurus, and they only existed in books. Now they're finding new fossils again. So we are learning stuff every single day. Um, again, they'll find something, they could find something tomorrow. You could find something in 10, 15 years that ends up being the oldest dinosaur we ever know of, which is really cool. But we know up until 66, 66 million years ago, the earth changed drastically. There was an asteroid that hit. There was lots of things that changed the climate after that. And then we see pretty much a hard stop there where like what we consider big non-avian, they're not birds, dinosaurs, uh, were wiped out. And, 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 and that's not the only time that's happened. There's been several extinctions over the course, five extinctions over the course of Earth's history that we know of that caused massive, um, you know, wildlife to, and plants and everything to just be completely changed. Wow. So I'm going to ask you uh, one last kind of couple sets of questions that we had going on here. Oh. Um, so you did mention that there were some, the birds today were kind of descendants from dinosaurs, correct? Yes. Yes, um, are, there, are there any other animals, um, you may have mentioned, you may have mentioned some, but I was taking down questions. Are there any other animals? And then the final one, are there any dinosaurs that are close to kind of like humans? Oh, okay. Okay. Excellent question. So in terms of other things that are related to dinosaurs, there are definitely uh, the crocodile thing, right? So dinosaurs kind of fit into between birds and crocodiles on sort of what we call the evolutionary tree. There are a little bit of this, a little bit of that. So looking at crocodiles today actually gives us a lot of information um, because they are those big hulking, you know, kind of predatory reptiles similar to what a dinosaur is. So they're not um, exactly dinosaurs like birds are. Birds are very much still a dinosaur family tree, just branched off into a new place, um, but they're, they're definitely related. So that's a, that's a cool thing and definitely something scientists use um, to look at the scales on their back and stuff like that. Um, I was mentioning that, that we know a lot about feathers now and that there are a lot of feather dinosaurs. That's because technology has gotten so much better that we can look at uh, things in microscopes and, and really, really, you know, look closely at some of these fossils and think, see things like fossil imprints um, from feathers and stuff like that. 
So in terms of what's related to dinosaurs today, all those birds, every single one of them, I saw someone mention a chicken. Absolutely. If you look at the skeleton of a chicken, it looks a lot like that T-Rex. It's got the same sort of belly with those ribs and, and the legs and the way the feet, you know, kind of stick out and the neck and the, it, they're very similar, which is really, really cool. So definitely something that we use to study. Something that was like a human. Well, I would say there were definitely smart dinosaurs, right? Now you see a lot of this in the Jurassic World movies as well. Where they kind of start talking about the velociraptors and stuff like that. Um, we definitely know some of them would have been very smart. They would have had it been, right? Especially the smaller ones that are hunting bigger things. Uh, so in terms of being close to human, I'd say that. That's a good example of something because humans we know have these big brains that are kind of different, set us apart from other wildlife um, on the earth, which makes us a little bit different and special. And they're like humans in the sense that they were able to exist in all parts of the world, which a lot of animals aren't. If you think about animals we know today, like lions and things like that, they really live in certain places of the world. They don't kind of go everywhere, but dinosaurs were able to find a place to live everywhere on the entire world, just like humans today. Well, that is so cool, guys. Can we, can we give a, a round of applause for our presenter? Well, I applaud you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for coming. I, I hope you'll come and see us in person. Um, your school has ways for you to come and see us. We would love for you to do that. There is so much to see here, not just dinosaurs. There's gems and minerals, one of my favorites. There's some culture halls, which are really, really interesting. And there's a whole wildlife hall, which shows you all these modern animals in these beautiful settings um, that show you kind of what they, what they look like. And you get an up close view of things that aren't alive, you know, so that you don't have to worry about being safe. <laughs> hey, one more thing for all of you that are watching. If you are in the Pittsburgh area and you want to visit the Carnegie Museum, we actually do have some free tickets for you. So if you want to come, all you have to do is have your parents contact us. You could contact the, you know, Camp Director Sheik or Camp Director Shelley, and we'll make sure to mail out some tickets for you. So that way you could come and see the dinosaurs in person. You gotta see them in person. I hope you'll all take your school up on that offer. That's a great offer because honestly, there's so much to do and see here. We have an art museum attached to our museum as well. So, and a big library. There's so many cool things here.